Hello, everyone. I hope that you can hear me okay. I wanted to take a quick second to say thank you guys for joining us. We really appreciate it here at IHEC. We're really glad you could make it for today's webinar. We do have Sheila Nesbitt who will present her presentation shortly. However, we were gonna wait a few more minutes just to make sure that some other people can log in. So just hang tight, then I will go over a few little housekeeping rules and then we'll get started in the program. Thank you. All right, everyone, we are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, as those who haven't joined us yet will still be able to log on and join us. So once again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're very happy that you could log in with us. And I will hand it over to Sheila in a few short seconds, but I just wanted to go over a few of the tools that you guys can utilize as you are listening to today's presentation. There is a question little drop box that you can submit questions to throughout the presentation. This will allow me and our presenter, Sheila, to see if you have any or any questions during the presentation. You can feel free to type those in there and submit them to us. We will either get to them right then if it's something that has to do with a certain topic or we will take a few short pauses throughout the presentation. 
Also, there is a chat box. So that is something that you guys can utilize. You can select who it goes to. So if you open up that chat box on the right, you can select two, and then it can go to the entire audience. Throughout the presentation, there may be a point where the presenter is asking a question. So that chat box will be key for you to utilize during that time. I think I covered the main things that I will have you guys use. If you guys have any immediate questions just for me or in the chat, you can um, select to send those to the organizer under those instead of the whole audience. All right, Sheila, are you with us? I'm here, Emma. Perfect. Thank you so much. I am ready to hand it off to you, and I'm very excited for this presentation. Great. Thanks, Emma. I, I'm really glad to be here as well and have a chance to, to talk with a few people from, from Illinois. So uh, thanks for joining me today. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, what happens when they turn 21, uh, addressing over service of alcohol. Uh, with a focus on that legal age population. So, uh, so here is, uh, uh, here I am. <laughs> uh, I'm Sheila Nesbitt. I am a coalition coordinator uh, based in Minnesota. Uh, and I have been in substance misuse prevention for a little over 20 years now. Uh, in that time, I've had an opportunity to work with um, several campus communities, uh, both in Minnesota as well as in other parts of the United States, uh, as well as communities that aren't uh, particularly a, a campus community uh, around uh, working on substance misuse prevention. So I'm looking forward to having a chance to talk with you all today. Uh, here are some of the things that I'm hoping uh, that we get a chance to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of addressing over service of alcohol uh, as part of your prevention program. Uh, we're going to talk about two strategies uh, that uh, we have used locally here in Minnesota uh, and that have been used in other parts of the country as well. Uh, and our webinar today isn't going to be a full implementation uh, training. Uh, you know, it's not going to be an instruction manual on how to do these strategies, but it will give you a sense of what's possible as well as some of those action steps that you might take if this is something you're interested in getting started uh, in your community. Uh, so a little more background uh, about who I am and where I come from. Uh, I uh, work with a coalition, a substance misuse prevention coalition called Partnership for Change. Uh, we serve uh, nine communities uh, in uh, Northwest Hennepin County, Minnesota, which is the county that includes Minneapolis. Uh, so that map that you see of my nine cities, we are just north and west of Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, the efforts that I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, we really started planning in 2013 and we started implementation in about 2014 uh, with some kind of pilot rollout. Uh, so we're getting just about a five-year mark uh, from when we really began implementation. Uh, our uh, coalition is hosted at a local hospital, uh, at North Memorial Health Hospital, uh, within our trauma services uh, department. Uh, I'm actually the injury prevention coordinator at the hospital. Uh, and uh, so if you aren't familiar with hospitals as a partner in prevention, I encourage you to, to uh, you know, find out uh, what hospitals in your area uh, are a level one uh, trauma center. Uh, there are varying, uh, if they're a level two or, or three or four, there are different levels of requirements that they have. Uh, but particularly your level one trauma centers are required to have an injury prevention coordinator. Um, so they might be an, uh, a, a potential partner for you. I know in our area, uh, I think that we're a strong partner uh, in this work. Uh, but, you know, in, in looking back at where we were at in 2013 and 2014, uh, we had done a pretty comprehensive needs assessment uh, with our partners, you know, getting input and looking at the data. And we really had a growing concern about alcohol use, particularly among legal age young adults. Um, we also knew from working with our partners uh, that we had a high level of interest from law enforcement which really translated into a high level of readiness to do something. 
Um, so I was very lucky. I was very blessed. Uh, that we had, you know, strong data that helped point us in a direction and that our partners were, were willing to jump on board with us. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, we're going to take a moment here and think about and talk about um, how did we come to look at over-service uh, and, you know, why you might be interested in looking at these types of strategies. Uh, so I'll start first with, this is some national data from uh, the Youth Risk Behavior uh, System, or YRBS, uh, and it really points to, un to binge drinking as an issue, not just for underage high school students, but, you know, traditional college age, and frankly, it, it doesn't end uh, at 24. We know uh, that uh, binge drinking uh, and potential issues with alcohol continue through the lifespan. When we took a look at data from our specific region, so PFC region means those nine cities that Partnership for Change uh, serves uh, in Northwest Hennepin County. When we took a look at our local data, uh, we had done a survey uh, of youth and young adults. So our young adult alcohol survey was conducted in 2012. And when we took a look at this, this certainly showed us that, you know, holy cats, we needed to do something about legal age alcohol use. Uh, and, you know, potentially somewhat good news for you, although I don't know if this holds true where you're at, uh, but those uh, who reported that they were currently enrolled as a student uh, were significantly less likely to drink than non-enrolled uh, students. So uh, this was a survey of 18 to 25 year olds. So we potentially had some high school students in there. Um, but we really focus on that um, student population as being college students compared to non-enrolled uh, non students. Um, we also know, I didn't make a, a chart here for you, um, but we also knew from that survey that 72% of young adults believed that it was very or somewhat likely that a drunken adult would be served in a bar or restaurant. So we knew that there at least was the perception in the community that it was very likely uh, that somebody would be served even if they were intoxicated. And we compared that to our underage alcohol compliance rates from our compliance checks that law enforcement were conducting. Uh, and our bars and restaurants um, had about a 95% um, pass rate or compliance rate. So our bars and restaurants in our area uh, really were doing a pretty good job in making sure that they were checking ID and not serving to people who are underage, who are under the age of 21, um, but there was at least the perception uh, that they were pretty likely to serve somebody who was intoxicated. And both of those are not allowed under, under our law. Uh, so I just want to pause for a minute here uh, and give you a chance for a little reflection. Uh, you can share your response in the chat if you'd like, um, but think to yourself um, and share with us if you'd like, what percent of your prevention efforts are focused on those under 21 uh, compared to those who are of legal drinking age? So if you think about that for a moment, not hard and fast, but kind of your guesstimate, I can tell you that for Partnership for Change, prior to 2014, 100% of our prevention efforts were focused on underage youth. Uh, now, we do not have any um, residential uh, campuses in our nine cities. We do have a number of uh, two-year uh, colleges. Um, we have uh, some commuter students who might live in our cities and attend a four-year college, uh, but we do not have any residential campuses. So I think that's part of the reason, um, you know, why we had a focus on that underage population. Uh, we also had a drug-free communities grant um, that allowed us only to look up through age 18. Uh, so there were a few reasons why, you know, why our focus had been on underage uh, alcohol use. Um, but I can tell you in, in 2014, as we took a look at our, our needs assessment, we certainly recognized that we needed to include some strategies to look at over 18 and particularly over 21. So now we're going to take a look at what we did about this, knowing that we had a, a concern among uh, about alcohol use uh, for those over the age of 21. 
so we actually, um, I'm going to talk about uh, our strategies. I'm going to talk about one strategy first and then our second strategy. Uh, and they were part of a comprehensive mix. We had a variety of things that we were working on as part of our, our comprehensive uh, prevention plan in the community. But I'm going to focus on our two strategies. Uh, that really dealt with uh, over-service of alcohol. Uh, so the first is um, place of last drink or polled. Uh, and this strategy documents uh, where an offender or victim in an alcohol-related uh, law enforcement incident consumes their last drink. Uh, so basically, uh, if law enforcement is dealing with someone during a traffic stop, or they're responding to a call for service, and that officer believes that alcohol played a role in the incident, uh, they are going to record information about the place of last drink or poll. So in our conversation today, I'm going to focus on uh, our implementation of polls uh, as our Partnership for Change uh, partners. Uh, but there are also other pulled uh, projects uh, that you could look at or, or check out. Uh, the ones I'm most familiar with are in uh, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, um, Ventura County, California. So we are not the only, uh, the only state or the only uh, coalition that's working on this issue. But I will focus on what I know best, which is what my coalition has done. Uh, so uh, we do have a strong collaboration uh, with our law enforcement partners. Uh, we reached out to our chiefs uh, and we asked for volunteers. Uh, we had ongoing partnerships with them, so we particularly reached out for several of our strategies that were starting in 2014. Uh, and uh, we had several departments that, that jumped up and volunteered. Uh, and I, again, have really been blessed by uh, the partners that have been working with us on this, and uh, the, they're all men, so I can say, you know, all these all these guys uh, really were were great and so beneficial uh, to us. Uh, so our uh, task force um, began meeting regularly uh, to research and develop a practical and operative system to collect this last drink data. Uh, and I really want to highlight two critical early decisions that were made that really shaped the direction of our polled project. Uh, so the first is we had a meeting among chiefs just to get their initial thoughts and feedback about what strategies we might undertake. And as we began at that meeting, as we began talking with our chiefs about place of last drink, I had one chief, Chief Benner from, from Brooklyn Center, uh, as we shared how place of last drink had been used in other communities, uh, it really had been focused on collecting information about the place of last drink for traffic involved incidents. So basically for DUI was the focus. And Chief Benner said, I don't know why we'd only focus on DUI. If I have two guys who got in a fight in an apartment parking lot, I want information about that. I don't know why we would ignore that incident and only focus on it if they got in a car. So uh, that expansion beyond DUI to collect this place of last drink information uh, in, in all uh, law enforcement uh, alcohol-related incidents uh, was uh, really key in shaping our project. And you'll see as, as we move forward, there are a couple places where you'll see that come up and what that means for us. The second really key uh, early decision uh, that we made was at the first task force meeting that I had with Sergeant Tui and, and Chief Michelson and uh, Officer Long. Uh, and uh, they asked, well, how are we going to start collecting this information? And I said, well, that's why I have a task force because we're gonna help, you're gonna help me figure that out. And they looked at me and said, the only thing that is going to work and be worth our effort is if we create an online real-time system so that this data can be easy to collect 
and easy to use. Right from the get-go, they were not interested in paper forms. They were not interested in emails flying back and forth or whatever other system we could have created. So that's not to say that that isn't going to work or might not work in other communities. Uh, but for us, uh, I was glad that we started off from the beginning looking at um, an online system to be able to collect this information. Uh, so again, uh, you know, from the beginning, uh, we knew that we did not want to just focus on, on traffic-related incidents. Uh, so uh, this is a, a current reflection of the types of offenses uh, that we collect, or these are the, the categories that our officers can indicate their incident was. Uh, and we really, uh, you know, in the time that we have used our poll uh, project, we really have had a significant expansion of the types of offenses, uh, and we discovered that we wanted more detail. We got a lot of feedback from, from users, both uh, people who are inputting the data, what makes sense to them, uh, as well as people who are using this data and reporting and taking a look at it. Um, so again, uh, this isn't necessarily what has to work for everybody, but feedback from our users, these are the categories that are working well for us. Uh, now, I'm not going to take a lot of time to talk about our specific system uh, and go into, you know, a, a software demonstration. Uh, there's just, this just gives you a sense uh, of what our system looks like. Um, but I think it is helpful for you to know that at least in our, my eyes, uh, we created a very functional, uh, frankly, fantastic uh, statewide system that allows real-time data entry and real-time reporting. And we created the system for $15,000. This was not a huge expense. Uh, so we were able to get this up and running for $15,000. Uh, another key piece uh, to know is that uh, when we talk with officers, uh, when they are using the system, uh, they can access it in their squad, uh, on their the, the laptop that's in their um, squad, uh, or they can access it actually from even from tablets, from mobile devices. Um, but it takes them about 60 seconds to enter a case. We tried to keep this um, very simple and straightforward. Uh, we knew that if we increased, if the, the reporting burden, if it took too long or was onerous, it wouldn't happen. Uh, so this is something they can, they can start their shift, they open this up on their, uh, on their computer, uh, and they just keep it running through their shift. If they respond to something that they believe is alcohol involved, they um, click over into this website, they add a case, and 60 seconds later, we have the data that we need. And they can move on to their next call. Um, so again, I'm not trying to focus too much on our online system, but I just wanted to give you a sense of, um, you know, this chart is pulled directly from our heads up display, which is something that officers have direct access to. So they click a button and uh, it populates with um, several charts about their particular department uh, or depending on what level they're at. Uh, they, some administrators uh, within departments have uh, access to a little bit more data from other departments. So, uh, and you can see from this information why it is so important that we are looking and focused beyond DWIs. So although it tends to be around 50% of our incidents, we would miss a, a large part of the picture of what is happening in our communities if we only focused on collecting last drink data on our DUIs. So you can see there are a range of other incidents that we have. Now we have some departments that have made the decision that in terms of rollout and communication with officers, that they are only going to focus on DWI. So we do have some participating departments who instruct their officers, when you have a DWI offense, this is an additional step you take. And they don't take it with other uh, calls. Uh, 
Uh, so this actually may slightly overrepresent uh, a true picture of how many alcohol-related offenses in our communities are DUI. Uh, now I'm going to give you a little sense of our data. I, I jump into uh, some case examples of what how we have used our full data. Uh, but this just gives you a sense of kind of what we're able to find out because we collect this information. Uh, so we did a system-wide analysis of our poll data. I actually, I go in there and play with our poll data and take a look all the time. Uh, but we recently had uh, an, a Master's of Public Health and MPH student uh, who uh, did some analysis for us as part of her master's thesis. Uh, and I'm actually really excited to say we've, we now hired her. She was so great. Uh, so she is our coalition coordinator now. But... Um, so this is taking a look at all of the offenses that were in our database statewide or system-wide for everybody who's participating. Uh, so we had just over, or we had over 8,000 cases uh, since we began collecting data. And you can see that the largest uh, single location type is for on-sale retailers. But we do collect data about other types of locations. So occasionally, uh, you know, when when law enforcement is um, responding to an incident, somebody might have been drinking at a private residence, or they might have been at a community event or festival. So we collect information about that. Um, but we do pay particular attention, and kind of our focus with polls is taking a look at um, those incidents that are uh, involved, that are um, coming from an on-sale retailer, uh, because we do have more regula regulatory authority and there is more responsibility for a licensed alcohol retailer to ensure that they are not serving an obviously intoxicated person. So it is not to say that every polled incident uh, is an illegal service to an intoxicated person because we don't know necessarily how they appeared before they had that last drink. So we are taking a look at trends and patterns, not stating that 42% um, were an a case of illegal service of alcohol. But gives you a sense of kind of where these are coming from. Uh, now we did also uh, take a look at, uh, we collect information on the breath alcohol content or the BAC uh, of uh, the, the people uh, that are involved in the incident. Some of these are offenders, some of these are victims. The, the vast majority of them are offenders. Um, so uh, we do have a, a number of cases where a, a BAC is not collected. It's not always appropriate to collect a BAC uh, for every incident. But we have over 6,000 incidents uh, where a, uh, a BAC was collected. And for those, the average BAC level is 0.165. Now, uh, for those of you who are familiar with BAC levels, you know that that is um, generally a significant level of impairment, 0 0.08 being the legal limit for driving. So 0 0.165 is more than twice the legal limit for, for alcohol use. Uh, and you can see that we have had 30 cases where the BAC was over 0 0.40, uh, which is actually considered a, a lethal dose uh, of alcohol. Um, so that indicates people that most likely um, have a significant um, physical impairment. Uh, uh, it's a dangerous level of alcohol. If they have any level of functioning uh, at these very high BAC levels, uh, we are certainly uh, concerned about potential uh, substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder. Uh, so then again, we took a look uh, specifically at our DUI uh, cases uh, and took a look at where those uh, people reported their last drink. And you can see that actually uh, for DUI incidents, people are more likely to report an on sale re um, having their last drink at an on sale retailer uh, than they were uh, just for all of our cases. 
I think that kind of makes sense from, from what we know. If people are out drinking, they need to get away home. If they were drinking at a private residence, whether it's their own residence or a friend's house or family, um, they might be staying there. We might see other types of, of incidents uh, coming from a private residence. So um, this section is really just, I think, to help us realize, give you a sense uh, that our poll data gives us a better understanding of what is happening in our community. Uh, so this can benefit our prevention efforts uh, generally, uh, you know, kind of across the board. Um, but I'm also going to take a few minutes and kind of show you what we have been able to do with this poll data uh, specifically through taking a look at three different um, case examples. So the first example I'm going to share is from um, Plymouth, Minnesota, on uh, our work with the Plymouth Police Department. Uh, they were one of our, uh, they were on our original task force. Uh, they helped us design and organize uh, our polled project. Uh, and they were one of our first communities to begin uh, using and collecting polls. So they started in February 2014. They started collecting data. They wanted to collect data for a couple of months and just get a sense of what was happening in the community. Uh, and they uh, had a stated intent that they would not be using that data. They were not going to act on that data right away. They just wanted to see uh, what their baseline was. Uh, they then, in April, uh, notified their 30 licensed alcohol retailers, um, on-sale alcohol retailers, uh, so basically their bars and restaurants. Uh, that they were, so they sent notice that they would begin collecting this information, and they told uh, the retailers, you know, please contact us if you have any questions. And I can tell you our partner in Plymouth thought that his phone would ring off the hook. He was prepared for retailers to come storming to the, the police department, uh, probably with lighted torches, because they would be so concerned about the fact that we were starting this initiative. And I can tell you, he actually did not get a single phone call or email. He heard nothing from retailers. So we don't know if they didn't really pay attention, uh, if they didn't understand what this was, um, but it, it went over very quietly. Um, so when we took a look at our data uh, this fall, I can tell you that um, they had, in the, the years that they've been implementing this, in about four and a half years, They've had 605 total cases entered into the fold system. Uh, and here's where we get to the case element for a specific retailer for them. They had 115 calls for service to one particular establishment. So if you take a look at this, they have 30 retailers licensed in their city. 20% of alcohol-involved incidents came from one location known as Cowboy Jack. So uh, when they had found this out, uh, in 2014, they had begun collecting information. And right from the beginning, Cowboy Jack uh, kind of jumped right to the surface with a significant number of calls for service. Uh, so this was really our first major test case for using poll data. So, uh, and you can see back in 2014, uh, Cowboy Jacks was actually 26 and a half percent of entry. So again, way over representing compared to the fact that they had 30 um, alcohol retailers in the city. Uh, so they began by uh, working with uh, the establishment. So their community resource officer uh, reached out to the manager uh, of Cowboy Jacks. And the manager said, go ahead and notify us if you have an incident, because I don't think this is happening at our, at our location. So uh, when we would identify uh, that there had been an incident uh, where somebody reported they were drinking at Cowboy Jack's, uh, we would send brief information about that incident. Basically saying, last night at you know 10.30 PM, officers pulled a vehicle over, um, the driver of the vehicle had a BAC of 0.15 and reported that they were drinking at Cowboy Jack. The driver was a 26-year-old white male. 
Uh, and each time, Cowboy Jacks, when we would give them this information, would say, oh, there's no way. That wasn't our place. We weren't serving anybody like that last night. Uh, so they, they poo-pooed it for the first few months. Uh, we continued going through a process of notifying them about issues. Uh, but in January 2015, their liquor license came up for renewal. Uh, they were brought in front of, uh, we're a local control state, which means alcohol licenses are issued by the city council or our county, um, our county board. Uh, so in Plymouth, uh, Cowboy Jacks had to go before the city council. And our uh, chief of police largely using poll data, but also using other law enforcement data about number of calls for service uh, and, and kind of what their relationship had been with, uh, with Cowboy Jack, um, presented information to the city council with kind of the, the end result of that or the council resolution uh, was uh, that they made, uh, they put a condition on Cowboy Jack's liquor license. Uh, so they said that Cowboy Jack, if they were uh, noted as the place of last drink for more than four incidents in a single quarter, uh, they would have to come before the, the city council again. Uh, so it was a condition of their liquor license. And lo and behold, uh, although for six months Cowboy Jack had been telling us that there's nothing we can do, this is not coming from our establishment, we don't know what's going on. Why are you saying uh, that people have been drinking at Cowboy Jack? Uh, once it was made a condition of their license, they significantly reduced uh, their um, the number of times that they were listed as a poll. Uh, and you can see kind of how that trend, uh, that was uh, a significant drop. It has creeped up again, um, but we've been keeping an eye and you can see overall uh, that we have, um, really been happy with uh, with the number, with the decrease that we had seen in incidents at Cowboy Jack. Um, I also will just do a, a brief example of another city uh, named, called Excelsior uh, here in Minnesota. Uh, they began collecting data in 2014. And they're an example of a city that has a significant issue around um, DUI driving uh, under the influence criminal vehicular operation and criminal vehicular homicide. Uh, so they, uh, in January 2016, uh, they passed, their uh, city council passed a new alcohol policy and they created a, a sliding scale based on seating capacity uh, that larger establishments uh, can, there can be a, a comparison for larger establishments compared to smaller establishments and the number of polled entries that they are allowed uh, uh, to have within uh, each quarter. Uh, you can also see that, uh, and one thing that we do uh, as we talk with new departments that are coming on board, that they really do need to think about the issue of amnesty for self-disclosed incidents. So that basically means that we don't want a bar or restaurant to be concerned about calling for a law enforcement response if they need help with something. So if there is, if a, a fight is starting to occur at a bar, we want them to call law enforcement and not be concerned and say, oh my goodness, but we can't be listed as a poll. So we basically say, if we get a call from you and respond to an incident, uh, or there's something that you need help with, it will not count as a polled entry. So we want to make sure that they still feel comfortable con contacting law enforcement and calling for help. Uh, so this, we took a look at their DUI rates. Uh, and uh, you can see that there has been a significant downward trend uh, since they began implementing uh, polled and particularly since they um, passed uh, the alcohol policy. My third case example uh, for polled is Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, and I thought this was a, a, an interesting one for this webinar because Mankato is home to a large uh, four-year state college. Uh, so they began participating 
uh, with polls in July of 2014. Uh, they have over a thousand uh, total cases entered into the system. Uh, and for Mankato, unlike a number of other, other our other communities, they do show a higher percentage involving people under 21. So trying to give you a snapshot of what it might look like in more of a campus community, uh, unlike some of our other polled communities. <coughs> Uh, and I can say that um, Mankato's focus has really been on being able to use this data for feedback with retailers, for education to help them identify what is going on. In the same way that the poll data gives us a better understanding of what is happening in the community, Mankato is focused on using their poll data to give retailers a better understanding of what is happening. Uh, with the level of information that we collect in our polled system, we're able to identify what times of day are most likely to result in a poll, what days of the week are most likely to result. Uh, and then the retailer can take a look at what's happening that our Thursday nights are so popular, uh, or that you know we have so many polled entries. Uh, does it, you know, is there any connection with when you have uh, security staff on site or not? Are there any particular drink specials um, that might be affecting this? We can say several of our restaurants identified their, their um, kitchen closes at midnight, but they continue serving for another two hours. Uh, several of our establishments have decided uh, to keep their kitchens open until 2 a.m. or until 1.30 or something like that, just to allow more complete food service through some of those higher alcohol hours, and they saw their poll re um, reduced. So this just gives you a, a, some examples of what we have seen in different communities who have been implementing polls. So I wanna talk for a moment about the role of coalitions, kind of what we have done. I don't know how many of you are our um, actual law enforcement, uh, sworn law enforcement, or within a law enforcement department. Uh, but if you are a coalition member, a community member, uh, some of the things that, that we felt uh, were very helpful in our involvement uh, were to hold those initial discussions with law enforcement uh, and keeping that open-ended. Uh, you know, not just arriving on their doorstep uh, saying, you know, here's a package program that we're ready for you to implement. Go ahead, aren't you going to do it? We really sat down and, and sought feedback. What are you interested in? How would this look for you? What do you think? Uh, we also, I think uh, it was very helpful that we were able to coordinate a multi-jurisdictional uh, task force, uh, you know, just pulling together multiple departments. So it wasn't one department trying to forge ahead on their own. Uh, they were able to learn from each other and there is, you know, somewhat uh, safety in numbers and support from, from peers and colleagues. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time providing technical assistance and help, on, help with problem solving. Uh, so I am talking with a lot of different departments who are implementing polls, and I'm paying attention to what is working here. How have they done this? How did they answer this question? So that when I talk to a new department or I'm talking with our partners, uh, I'm able to share examples. Hey, here are three ideas. Here are three ways I know other departments are dealing with this. Uh, and providing that can be, can be helpful. Um, we also spend quite a bit of time recognizing our champions and our contributors. Uh, so we have a number of strategies involved uh, to thank them individually, uh, to thank their department in a way that it goes into their personnel file, uh, to, um, nominate them for different awards uh, and recognize them. Uh, we also uh, spend some time analyzing and reporting findings. Uh, our police departments, our law enforcement departments have access to the pulled data, uh, but they, aren't, they don't necessarily have access or the time to be able to see how they compare regionally. How do they compare to the statewide system? So we provide some of that back to them, and we're available if there is a particular question that they want to answer through the poll data, we can do some of that analysis for them. Uh, 
after this, uh, after today's webinar, you will get uh, access to um, these slides. So I'm not going to go through it in detail, but just know that we do recognize various ways that we work with retailers. Uh, including, you know, recognizing and affirming those who are um, never listed as polls, uh, up through various ways that we work with retailers who do seem to be having an issue with over service, who are frequently listed as a place of last strength. Uh, and you will see our um, our last piece there uh, for those that are listed and polled is uh, conducting undercover observation. Uh, a program that we call RAVE, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute, what that is and what that looks like. So here I want to pause for just a minute and see if there are any questions. Yeah, so if any of you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and open that little question drop box and submit any questions that you have, and we'll wait a few seconds. So Emma, maybe I'll continue on and we can see if anybody has any questions, feel free to continue to submit them to Emma. Um, oh, I'm gonna move yeah. on and we do have a spot at the end. Oh, here's a question, okay. All right, so I can go ahead and read that aloud for everyone. So the question is, is polled considered an evidence-based practice? Uh, so that is that is actually a complicated question. Uh, so here, here is the start of the answer to that. Uh, it is not recognized on a federal system, although the um, NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, does list this as a recommended strategy. So depending on what your definition of evidence-based strategy is, uh, it is recommended by a federal agency. Uh, we also have um, evaluation uh, results similar to what I have, you know, started to show here uh, that shows it does, uh, it has uh, reduced DUI, uh, it has um, been able, we have been able to reduce uh, uh, incidents of over-service uh, in on-sale establishments. Uh, Hold was recently um, published in a book uh, by the American Public Health Association. I can send that link or that information to Emma uh, that she could share with you all. Uh, so depending on what your definition or what requirements you need for whether this is evidence-based, uh, yes, it, it, you can say that it is evidence-based, but it is not on um, every federal registry. So hopefully that helps. Are there other questions, Emma? Yes, we do have a few more. So thank you very much for submitting that and um, answering that as well, Sheila. The next one is, how could a community do this without an online system? And do you know if anyone has ever tried this? Yep. Uh, yes. Uh, I would say we are the first uh, example of doing this as an online system. Uh, there are some other communities that are trying it and, and uh, beginning to implement an online system, but there are a number of communities that have not, uh, that started this not online. Uh, so, you know, collecting that either, you know, kind of the big questions are, are you going to collect that at the time of the law enforcement incident or collect it later in the adjudication process? So there are a number of polled efforts that collect it, say, after somebody has been arrested uh, for a DUI and they have pled guilty or they have been convicted uh, in court uh, and then perhaps they need to go to a victim impact panel or they need to go to some education and they collect that information at that time. So it has been done in more of a paper pencil uh, system uh, either by officers or later in the adjudication process. Um, so it has been done. Uh, I think it does impact um, how quickly you can use the information. So, Perfect. are there that's, other questions? Emma? That's all I see thus far. 
Okay, great. Awesome. Um, and you. we will have time for a few more questions. Um, we have a few more minutes and I'm gonna um, touch on our, our second strategy here. Um, but if you think of more questions, we'll have an opportunity. Feel free to, to add them in at any time uh, and we'll try and address them before the end of the webinar. So now I'm gonna spend a minute talking about our Retail Alcohol Vendor Education Program or RAVE. Um, and actually we have an inside joke that we don't know if that E stands for Education or Enforcement or both, um, but that's how we go with it. Uh, so this is uh, a program that we adapted from the Minnesota Alcohol Gambling Enforcement Division. It's our state level uh, alcohol enforcement agency. Uh, so we adapted uh, from them. Uh, so RAVE involves uh, trained teams. Uh, we, as we have implemented, we always have at least one sworn law enforcement officer uh, as part of that team. Uh, and they make unannounced undercover visits uh, to liquor establishments. Uh, so they can observe what is happening at that bar or restaurant, uh, paying particular attention to issues of over service. And then we provide feedback uh, to the managers or owners of those bars and restaurants, uh, including resources that can support responsible practices. Uh, so this is a nice counterpart to polled. If you think of these two going together, polled, uh, we collect that data if there is an incident that law enforcement believes is alcohol related. So a DUI or a physical assault or something happening in the community. RAVE is an opportunity for us to actually see what is happening with inside our bars and restaurants. What is going on with the service of alcohol that maybe we can, can congratulate a business on responsible practices or is there something going on that we're a little concerned about? So here's a little detail about it. We always have at least one sworn officer uh, and that um, they go out in teams of two. So that second person sometimes is a sworn officer or it may be a non-sworn partner uh, trained in RAVE. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm the one who advocated that there could be a non-sworn partner because I wanted to be able to be a person who could go out and do RAVE. So, uh, and I think it has actually gone well. Uh, but we just guarantee that both of those people, whether sworn or non-sworn, are trained in rape. So uh, those teams may also be from one law enforcement department, or they might be mixed between departments. Um, so it can be a multi-jurisdictional uh, team. Uh, we usually go out uh, 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, we gear that kind of based on feedback from the local law enforcement department. When do you want us out? Is it Friday night? Is it Saturday night? Do you want us to start at 8? Do you want us to start at 10? Do you let us know? We have also encouraged departments to consider whether or not they might need like a weekly, a weekday happy hour shift. Do you have some concerns about what might be happening around there? Uh, as we're getting, uh, as you know, we think ahead a few months and we think about March Madness. Uh, perhaps uh, some local departments might want a raise shift uh, specifically geared around certain um, you know, certain activities or around the Super Bowl. So we're open to that, um, but we're generally 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. This is part of what we uh, train our officers and kind of the parameters that we give them. Uh, we want visits to all on-sale retailers um, that have a full alcohol license. Now, we might not be able to hit, depending on how large our city is, we may not hit all of those alcohol retailers in one shift, but they're all eligible uh, for a RAVE visit. Uh, in Minnesota, we do have um, a 3-2 license. Uh, so that's, uh, they can only serve alcohol up to 3-2% uh, um, alcohol. Uh, we exclude those licenses. They tend to not be very alcohol focused. They are not a bar. Uh, we also exclude nominal retailers. Chipotle serves alcohol. We are not going to sit in Chipotle to observe their alcohol service. It is a nominal portion of their, their business. But we do also send home the message to our team that they should not assume that there's no issues or no need to visit. Okay? If they are an on-sale alcohol retailer within these parameters, we want a visit conducted. Uh, we do uh, notify retailers about, uh, about uh, RAVE uh, and offer resources to them. 
uh, when a rave team is out, we coordinate with on-duty patrol. Uh, so that that patrol supervisor can contact the rave team if there is a pulled incident in that area, particularly if somebody has uh, a BAC over 0.15. So basically, if we have a rave team out in the area and an office, an on-duty officer pulls over somebody for a DUI and they were a 0.15 and they said they were drinking at Sheila's bar, we are going to go over to Sheila's bar and do an observation right then, okay? We also, our RAVE team, depending on what, um, what jurisdiction we're in, we may contact that patrol supervisor if there is enforcement. If we observe something in a bar or restaurant that needs enforcement, we're gonna contact that patrol supervisor. We may need backup uh, because we may also be um, non-sworn or sworn officers from another department we're gonna pull in a local um, uh, officer just to make sure that we don't have those jurisdictional issues. So if it is an establishment in Osteo, Minnesota, uh, and we believe there, there needs to be an enforcement action, it will be an officer from Osteo that is involved in that. So when we conduct in, um, observations, these are our general guidelines. We take 20 to 60 minutes at each retailer. Uh, we, we have, you know, some ways that we are there so that we don't need to be drinking and we can kind of blend in. Uh, we have worked with departments to ask the question uh, if uh, officers would be allowed to purchase alcohol uh, if it's not consumed. There are some restaurants, uh, some bars in our area where it just seems odd if you walk in at 1230, uh, 12.30 a.m. and you're not ordering some type of alcohol. Um, but we usually have been able to work our way around, around it. Um, but we have um, been able to purchase non-alcoholic beverages or small food items. Again, just so that we don't want to tip them off or give people, you know, part of being undercover um, and unobserved is that we can blend in. So we look uh, for signs of impairment. Uh, it is generally easier uh, if somebody has been moving. Uh, you know, if they're sitting at their table, Maybe harder to observe signs of impairment, but when they're standing up, when they're going to the restroom, when they're talking with a server, we can maybe pick up on signs of impairment, and we will be watching uh, for service um, and, and trying to hear what's going on. Now, again, I'm not going to take a lot of time uh, with this information. You will get these slides afterwards, uh, but here's, uh, here are some examples of types of observations that we've made and then what that response or how we handle that up to, you know, the kind of the most significant egregious cases of over service. Uh, we can civilly violate that license and we will contact the license holder uh, to let them know that there is going to be a civil enforcement action against their alcohol license because of over service. This just gives you a, um, an idea of what our observation report looks like and the type of information that we're collecting. We obviously are not filling this out when we're at the bar, uh, but we will go in, we will be making notes of this. I take notes on my cell phone. Uh, and then uh, when we leave the premise, we'll, we'll uh, go into our car and fill out our observation report. As I said, we, um, we really are focused on providing feedback to retailers. Uh, so there are times that we uh, will do that during a rave, rave shift. That generally is if we have a reason to be concerned and we want to give them that immediate feedback while the situation is happening. Again, for both types of, of feedback, we are gonna try to have a positive inter in interaction. Our goal is to provide education and help retailers make better choices about responsible serving practices. Uh, we can also offer feedback after a rave shift. Um, sometimes we don't want the word to get out, you know, through the telephone tree uh, that a team is out. Uh, so depending on how serious it is or what the type of feedback is, uh, we will provide it at the end of a shift or potentially, you know, following up a few days later. So it's an opportunity for us to know what is happening, what is actually happening within retail establishments, and then be able to provide that feedback to those retailers to be able to give very specific, individualized ideas about resources and changes that they can make 
but they can more responsibly sell alcohol. So now I want to see if there are any questions about polls or raids. Yeah, we'll take a few minutes to take some questions. If you guys have any, you can type it into that question drop box. And maybe if, if while people are thinking about whether they have a question, um, I'll go ahead and, and share. Here is my contact information. So you can obviously either reach out to Emma if there's something that you need, or feel free uh, to reach out to me if you have a question or if there's something that I can help you with. But I'll still be here if you have any questions during this webinar. Thank you very much. And take a minute as we wait to see if any questions come to Offer a huge thank you to you, Sheila, for sharing your expertise. I know I've learned a lot while watching this webinar, so I very much appreciate the time you've taken. And we had a few little technical difficulties preparing, so thank you again for sticking with us through that. And with that being said, we can just hang out for a few minutes and kind of wait and see if anyone has any questions. Yeah, great. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here. I'd love to have more of a conversation with you. So feel free, if you have any questions, to reach out. And also, as you guys are maybe thinking of some questions, just as a reminder, you are able to look at any of our upcoming events through IHEC on the website. So that's eiu.edu slash IHEC. So you can see our upcoming webinars such as this. And we also have upcoming in-person trainings as well that you could attend. And it doesn't look like we might be getting any questions. So. Um, if you're okay, we can kind of end it up that you've got your information and everyone here as well is more than wel welcome to contact me via my email or um, you can call the office for the Illinois Higher Education Center. All that will be on your registration um, information that you guys sent in so you guys can contact me and I can get a hold of Sheila or she has her information for you guys as well. Great, thank you everyone for joining today. And thank, thank you, Emma, for, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I really appreciate it. Everyone, have a good afternoon.